Right, so charging a system, we need to get the refrigerant from the refrigerant tank into the refrigeration cycle. We want to make sure we don't damage the compressor, that we don't put contaminants inside the system, and we don't fractionate our refrigerant. So we're going to start off by getting our scale set up. We're going to zero our scale out, and we're going to measure how much the refrigerant weighs while it's not being used. So right now I have a starting point. What I'm going to do is write down how much that refrigerant weighs. Now I've got a starting point to go with. Take my manifold gauge set with my hoses. I'm gonna put the hose on my refrigerant tank. And what I'm gonna do is tighten it all the way up and I'm gonna leave it loose at the manifold gauge set. So just the yellow hose, the charging or service hose is loose right here. Then I'm gonna crack open this tank just barely and the refrigerant vapor from the tank is gonna push through the hose and out this point right here. It's gonna be leaking out or being purged out. I'm purging or pushing the contaminants out of that hose. Then I'm going to tighten it up right here at this middle point. Next I'm going to do is go ahead and open this tank all the way up and the refrigerant can't go anywhere because it's being stopped at this point right here. Then I'm going to turn my tank upside down and I'm going to put it back on my scale and then I'm going to zero the scale out. So whatever the scale has is showing right now is reading zero. This way as I take refrigerant out of the tank it's going to start showing up on my scale. Next thing we're gonna do is hook the gauges up to the system. We'll start with the low pressure side. And this is gonna be with the automatic low loss fittings. So we'll take with the two finger rule, wanna make sure two fingers are on this. Don't cut your hand because if the refrigerant hangs up, it's gonna shoot out the back and the front. So if it shoots out the back, it's gonna get the palm of your hand at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. We're talking severe frostbite there. And also make sure you keep your hand away from the very end. So here are only two fingers. If it does hang up, I'm free here and I'm free there. You can also use butyline gloves. That's your official answer use these butyline gloves. However, a lot of people try to use regular gloves and that's worse than your bare hands. If you use regular gloves, any kind of cotton gloves, they absorb the liquid refrigerant. So the liquid refrigerant absorbs into the gloves, boiling at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you can't get your hand out of the glove. It literally freezes the glove to your hand and that's gonna be a bigger problem. Now you're talking about long-term severe frostbite. I'm having only the two finger rule we're going to simply thread that on to the suction side. And what's inside of this hose is dirty, nasty, stinky, polluted air, moisture, air, contaminants. So we're then going to loosen the connection right here and the low temperature, low pressure, superheated vapor will push out of the unit through this hose and leak or purge right here at this connection. Then we go ahead with our two fingers and tighten that back up. That's a purge, very short amount of time, just for like a second. And we push that vapor out of that hose. Very simple to do. Now we have the high pressure hose. So getting over low loss fittings, this is the one we wanna make sure we're careful with. This is one's gonna have liquid refrigerant coming out. This will be the dangerous one. So we're gonna do this one. And on this one, don't stop. You either put it all the way on or take it all the way off. A lot of times it'll start spraying a little bit. Students get scared, they pull their hand away and they leave it spraying. Two things, push it all the way on or all the way off. But whatever you do, do not try to stop the refrigerant coming out with your fingers. Remember that's minus 40, you're talking about frostbite. So we're gonna take with our two finger rule and we're going to thread this onto the liquid side or the high pressure side. So in this hose, we have high pressure subcooled liquid. So we wanna very quickly just open and close this. You'll see liquid refrigerant come out, a little bit of cloud of refrigerant. You gotta do it very fast because you don't wanna be letting that liquid refrigerant out. Still gonna be the minimum amount, very small amount, but it pushes those contaminants out. Now we've purged our center hose, we've purged our blue hose, and now we've purged our red hose. And we know that any four or 500 series refrigerant is gonna be a blend of multiple different refrigerants. So we need to take it out in liquid form. You can also look at this as any refrigerant that ends in a capital letter, such as 410A capital A is gonna be a blend of refrigerant. We have to take it out as liquid forms. So it's gonna leave the tank as a liquid. So here you can see by having the tank upside down, the liquid is gonna be over here where the valve's at. So to get refrigerant out, we have liquid coming out of this valve. If I had it the other direction, only vapor would be coming out. And because it would be vapor, there'd be different percentages, different amounts of refrigerant that could be coming out. By having it in the liquid form coming out of this tank, we know it's the correct mixtures from the factory. So now we're gonna put refrigerant out of this tank into a running system. Key is for these examples, it's gonna be a running system. So liquid refrigerant out of the system into this unit. We got two options. We can open the red side and put it into the liquid side, or we can open up the vapor side and put it into the suction side. Liquid refrigerator, you're gonna put it in the suction side or you can put it in the liquid side. What do you think the answer is gonna be? It doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong, just think about it. 
So let's say it's an 80 degree day, 100 degree saturated temperature. We're dealing with 410A, so we'd be looking at approximately 318 high side. Because it's an 80 degree day, our tank pressure is gonna be at 236 PSI gauge. Saturated, liquid and vapor together, so you're looking at about 236 PSI gauge at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We're looking at about 130 PSI on the suction side. So to reiterate, high side 318 PSI gauge, tank 236 psi gauge and the blue side 130 psi gauge so if we were to open up the liquid side the high side it would connect this red hose through this little piston to the yellow hose we're now connecting both those hoses but if we think about this running operating system the pressure that the compressor is building it's raising the pressure up so that's how we get the 318 psi gauge well in the tank we only have 236 psi gauge which is going to be higher the pressure coming out of the unit or what's in the tank. That's right. The pressure in the tank is going to be higher. So the refrigerant is going to be flowing out of the unit with the higher pressure across the manifold gauge set into this yellow service hose and be flowing into our tank. We'll be taking the refrigerant out of the unit, this contaminated unknown refrigerant, and be mixing it with our brand new refrigerant in the tank. But luckily we know that we saw the video about the tanks and we know that there's a check valve built into this tank. So all it's gonna do is back the refrigerant up into the yellow hose and it's gonna stop right here at this connection. So they've already thought about that. So you don't have to worry about accidentally contaminating this tank. You don't have to worry about taking refrigerant out of the unit because it's gonna be a check valve. In most cases, assuming that check valve is working, you're gonna be safe. So can you charge a running system from refrigerant into that liquid side? Not practically, not like this you can't. So we can't charge it through the high side. So we're gonna close this valve back off because we can see that's not gonna work. The pressure in our unit is higher than the pressure in our tank. Let's look at another scenario. We're gonna take liquid refrigerant out of the system at 236 PSI gauge into the suction side at only 130 PSI gauge. Will that work? Absolutely, we got 236 here and only 130 there. Higher pressure here is gonna flow through the yellow hose. And if we open this valve, this piston moves and we're allowing refrigerant to flow. But wait a minute, that's gonna be going into our vapor line. And that vapor line is connected right to our compressor. So we'll be getting liquid refrigerant into our compressor. Well, we know that we gotta take this as liquid to prevent fractionation. We've already purged our hoses. We gotta protect that compressor. How are we gonna do that? And the answer is, throttling it in, throttling in short little bursts of refrigerant. What I'm gonna do is open and close this little valve. That allows a little bit of this liquid refrigerant to go through that valve, and now that little bit of liquid is inside of this blue hose. But that pressure and that refrigerant starts to expand, starts to expand our changing state from a liquid to a vapor, just like a metering device does. It allows the refrigerant to expand on the other side of that metering device. So the refrigerant in this hose is already starting to expand. Plus also, since we're using these automatic low loss fittings, we end up with a restriction right here. So it slows the flow of refrigerant down. Plus we have our Schrader core valve inside of here that slows the flow down also. Then we end up with this larger suction pipe. So that little bit of refrigerant ends up in that larger pipe, allows it to expand some more. And then it's going to expand entirely to a vapor by the time it ends up in the compressor. So now we've protected our compressor because we've only given it short little shots of refrigerant. Had, however, we opened this up, now we would have a problem. If we left this open too long or opened it up, liquid refrigerant, a solid stream of liquid would be flowing through this hose and to our compressor, and then we'd have compressor damage, and we've seen that before. So the answer is, on a running system, how do we charge it? We throttle it in through the suction side. Short little bursts. Now they also make a tool for charging liquid refrigerant. It's a little device that you can put on this yellow hose and it works like a metering device. It does slow down the flow of refrigerant. I still am not a big fan of those because I've seen people use those and because there's a small stream of liquid refrigerant, it still ends up being too much and it still damages the compressor. I personally like the throttling it in method. Some of the gauges have a little sight glass right here and you can see the refrigerant coming through. You can see it in the vapor. I've also seen people hook up sight glasses on their blue hose. They can see that it changes state into a vapor before it gets into that unit. So by doing little shots of refrigerant, we know that we're good. The next question I get is, how do you know before you give it the next shot? Over time, you're gonna get this down. You're gonna get used to it. You're gonna have a feel for it. But until then, one of the little tricks is you can put your hand right here at this valve and you can put your another hand here. And if you feel the temperature of both of these become the same or become equalized, you know that you're probably ready for another shot of refrigerant. 
Now, as you're farther away from your target superheat and target subcooling, you wanna add more and more shots more frequently. But as you get closer and closer to your target superheat and target subcooling, you wanna give slower and slower shots and you wait longer between times. In other words, I'm far away, I'll give it a shot, wait, give it a shot, wait, give it a shot, maybe several times. But now I'm getting closer and closer to my target. I'll give it just a little bit of a shot and I'm gonna wait like five or six minutes. Give that time for that refrigerant to flow through that whole system and see my superheat and subcooling adjust. When I think I'm finally there, I wait 15 minutes to know that I for sure have a balanced charge. As you get closer to your targets, you'll see that number move faster and faster. So opening and closing this at the beginning may not have made much difference, but now that you're almost at your target, you'll see that number move very quickly and it's very easy to overcharge the system. As I'm really being close to my targets, I like to go ahead and shut my tank off. I'll go ahead and close this valve back off. Now, as I'm giving it those last little bit of shots, I'm really draining a lot of that liquid refrigerant out of this hose. So that way I'm not overcharging it when I'm done. And that way we can get a target superheat and target subcooling match. When I'm done, I can check to see how much refrigerant I put into that system and I can write that down. Now we know how much refrigerant we added in and we can put that on our invoice to charge by that and also for our EPA records. Now that we're done with that, we can take our refrigerant tank back off. And because we have these automatic low loss fittings, I can go ahead and take it loose from the tank. Remember we've already shut our tank off. So when I take this hose loose, nothing's coming out. I like to then zero out my scale and put my tank back on it and see what my tank weighs. And I like to write that number back down. I know how much refrigerant I took out and I know my starting and end point. So that way, if my battery died or lost connectivity in between that, I had my starting point and my end point. So even if I didn't automatically calculate it, I can still do the math manually. The cool thing about having that end point written on my tank is when I go to that next call, I can make sure that they're matching. You can see if you have a leaking tank by those numbers not matching up. And I've had that happen before. I've seen where my end point number and my starting point number didn't match. Between the last call and today's call, I have a five pounds difference. I've lost down five pounds of refrigerant. A lot of times people will leave this little valve cap off and it leaks out this valve right here. So always leave that valve cap on so you don't lose refrigerant. But sometimes you can have just a small hole where it's been dropped too many times or set on the gravel too many times, or maybe this is starting to leak. So by knowing what your end point was and your beginning point, it solves the problem of if you lose connectivity, if your batteries die, and also you can check and keep track of it. By also having all those numbers on my tank, if I forget, I have that information right here so I can put it into my EPA logbook later on. So we know that that's done, we don't have to worry about that anymore, but now we need to take our gauges off of the system. This is gonna be a little different than the very first time that we talked about it. What I'm gonna do is take the high side off first, again with two fingers, and screw it quickly all the way off to where it does not leak any refrigerant out. And now I have this hose with some refrigerant in it and this hose with refrigerant in it. Because I've already purged all of these hoses, now we're going to bleed it across the manifold. That means I'm gonna go ahead and open up my high side gauge and it connects my high side to my service hose, which doesn't do anything. But then I'm gonna open up my suction side. As I open up this side, now both of these hoses are connected to my suction side and the refrigerant flows from the high side, from the service port, and it goes through the blue hose into the system or the refrigerant goes back into the system. I also like to lift up my hoses and also lift up my manifold gauge set to make sure gravity allows that refrigerant to drain into the system. Ideally, it should be changing state, boiling from liquid vapor already, but I've seen it before, the refrigerant sometimes gets trapped in the low points as it's boiling from liquid to vapor, the pressure drops, it gets back to saturation, and you still have some liquid refrigerant. So I like to be sure to lift it up, make sure I'm helping that liquid refrigerant drain through. And again, as these low loss fittings and those straighter cores act as a restrictor, sometimes it slows the refrigerant down where you're not getting that liquid refrigerant in. So just by lifting them up, it can speed that up. Next thing I do is take off my suction port, the two fingers, now I have only low pressure vapor, low pressure vapor, and low pressure vapor. Now a lot of times students will get upset, they'll say, hey, my high side didn't go to zero. Well, it won't go to zero. Your high side will only go down to what your low side is. So this number and this number should match even though the needle's pointing at different points. Now remember we're still open here, so I can pick any one of these and slowly open this connection or loosen this connection. This is gonna allow that refrigerant trapped in these three hoses to purge out. And because it's low pressure vapor, low pressure vapor, and low pressure vapor, it's all three of these are de minimis. So we can de minimis release all three of these at once, and then I'm down pretty close to zero or at zero. I go ahead and close this back up. 
Now you'll see that when you hang these in your van, sometimes these numbers will continue to climb and that's okay. It just means the temperature in the hose is going up and there's still vapor at zero PSI and those numbers go up. But because we've drained the refrigerator out of the hose, it's not enough to damage your hose or damage your manifold gauge set. Be sure and put these three connections on the back of your manifold gauge set so you keep them clean. There's gonna be oil residue inside of here and you don't want any kind of dirt collecting on that and causing these connections to fail. Then you wanna make sure you also put your valve caps back on these. Make sure it's a metal valve cap, a brass cap with that rubber O-ring to make sure it's connected. And remember the hexagon ones don't need that rubber O-ring. That's the only exception to that. So once your caps are on, you've drained this out, this goes back in the truck and you're ready to write up your service ticket. Now let's look at some other options with different type of connections. 